Hi, everybody. Welcome to our August edition of BioBytes. Yay, we're back. Um, my name is Jessica Frank, and I'm the Biological Medicine Program Manager at the Marion Institute, or MI for short. For those of you who happen to be new to this program, welcome, welcome. BioBytes is the Marion Institute's monthly virtual educational series. BioBytes connects you with some of the foremost experts in alternative health, natural healing, biological medicine today, speaking about key topics relating to wellness and empowered health. Um, before we get rolling into today's presentation, I have a few announcements and some housekeeping before we begin. I'm also curious about, about where people are joining us from, so feel free to go ahead and put that in the chat. I just uh, put in that I'm from San I'm actually presently in San Diego, which is unusual. Uh, so first, we will invite you to keep your mics uh, muted during the presentation, um, just for the recording purposes. And Secondly, we do really encourage people to chat questions. Please drop uh, questions into the chat function that's at the bottom of your uh, Zoom toolbar there as we go along. So as you see things coming along the presentation and you have a question, go ahead and drop it in the chat. What we do is after the presentation, we will go through those questions through the chat and have them um, answered by Christine. Uh, let's see. Thirdly, um, I'd love to go ahead and announce that our next BioBytes is September the 5th, and BioBytes is always the first Tuesday of the month at noon Eastern time. September the 5th, we will have biological medicine physician Dr. Dixon Tom discussing cancer's metabolic origins. So please make sure you're getting our emails, getting our newsletters, and following us on our socials in order to register for our September BioBytes. And we'll also share that registration link shortly. Last but not least, um, after this is all finished up, we'll send you a recording of this uh, episode as well as uh, bonus resources. So that'll all be dropped into your email inboxes within a week. Okay. I'm gonna add one more announcement. Okay. One more announcement because it started today. For those of you that are local, and even if you're not local, we highly recommend that you join um, the Marion Institute's Eat Local South Coast Challenge. Um, it, we are challenging you to eat local within a two, uh, 200 mile radius from wherever you live uh, for the whole month of August. You will get, you know, by signing up, you get emails weekly, just one email full of information on um, supporting you on how to eat local, how to support your local farmers and um, wherever you are in your region. So I see farmers out there in our audience today, and um, it's just a great thing to do and challenge your friends to do. It started today. You'll get the welcome email in the first email if you sign up today, um, and then you'll get another email in a week from us and just throughout the month of August. So highly recommend it. Chris, my teammate, Chris will put the link on um, the chat. So if you're interested in doing it, please make sure you register and you'll get some, some great info from us. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. All right, so here we are. We're talk talking about the epigenetics of health today and helping us dive deep into this conversation is Christine Dionese. Christine is an integrative epigenetic health specialist and host of the podcast, Well Examined. Her humble endeavor is to help individuals and kids and families activate their vision of health by harnessing the power of the epigenetic landscape and heal multi-generational trauma. Christine has spent the past 20 plus years in research, private practice, consulting, writing, and speaking on such wide ranging topics as epigenetic optimi optimization, biosocial inheritance, biological medicine, functional medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, immunology, human design, food and nutraceutical science, the, the human microbiome, quantum consciousness, and the, the science of spirituality. So she's well-versed and she's committed to helping create new sustainable and innovative models for expansive healing and thriving in the modern world today. So I'm super excited about this topic. Now, uh, without further delay, let's click some buttons here to bring Christine Denise Dionys on and take it away, Christine. You're welcome to begin. Well, thank you for the introduction and hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. So there's no better way than to start uh, a discussion about epigenetics than introducing you to the family. So 
who you see here is my great great aunt in Sicily with my grandmother. Uh, we were celebrating her hundredth birthday, so uh, celebrating longevity genes. And they are showing us that we are all ancient wisdom embodied. We're the culmination of everybody who came before us. And the way that I like to think about epigenetics is as a celebration. It's taking the very best of what's been conferred to us, maximizing our health potential on that, and optimizing uh, everything that kind of comes our way through the environment so we can pass along that in our legacy. So for those of you who are new to epigenetics, we say for better or worse, it's the science of how we've adapted to our environments over time and how we're best able to understand and accept these variables that are influencing our trait expression, which we'll get into soon. So we are always asking, what is disease showing us? I like to look at it as a process by which our body is attempting to heal at the epigenetic level. So it's showing how our varying environments are influencing our genetic trait expression and therefore how we will take instructions to heal the body. So in epigenetics, we like to talk about the cards we're dealt. So this will resonate with all of you card players out there. So the genetic profile we're born with, this is what we keep our entire life. So yes, there are things coded into our genetics that can make us more susceptible to developing certain health concerns. And the famous saying is that genes load the gun and epigenetics pull the trigger. My friends at True Diagnostic like to say, you can't change these cards, but it's all about how the game is played. So if we want to win the game, what are we going to do? Uh, we are either silencing or amplifying genes based on the information we give them. So we need to expose them to high quality information. So we could expose them to wonderful music and relationships and healthy food, void of pesticides, healthy water, and so on down the line, as opposed to the opposite of that, pesticides, pollutants, poor sources of water, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about the trajectory of epigenetics, how it started and where it's going and the exciting place that it is today. So this gent here, um, Conrad Waddington, back in 1942, he started to observe that there were these interactions between genes in their environment. And he started to talk to all of his research colleagues in stem cell biology, in adaptation and resilience. He started to get psychologists in on the conversation. And he was asking these people, what, what variables do you see that are influencing the trajectory of your patient's health and your subject studies? So he really propelled people to start looking at this idea of our genes are not our fate. When we jump up to 1975, we discover methylation, which we'll get into. And then the Human Genome Project was completed in 2003. Some of you here probably remember how exciting that was. Uh, but an exciting moment for me as a practitioner was in 2006, when direct-to-consumer genetic tests started to arrive. Before that, the cost for these tests was exceptionally prohibitive. And so you saw early things like Prometheus, Ancestry, 23andMe. Those are probably some of the ones that you're familiar with. Uh, when we skip ahead a couple more years, that's when we really start to get into the nuance of looking more microscopically at how we're aging across time, what accelerates it, what slows it down. And that was the research of a great guy named Steve Horvath. We'll get into his research a little bit later, but he introduced us to the idea of biological clocks. Um, and then a few years ago, well, I guess more than a few, back in 2016, Joe Cohen released the very best, most comprehensive direct-to-consumer whole genome testing kit called Self-Decode. Uh, that basically put health into consumers' hands who were interested in uh, looking at their entire uh, you know, genome and seeing 
all right, if this is a game that I can play here, if genes load the gun, but my environment is influencing, what changes can I start to make? Um, and since then, we were introduced with a test in 2020. It's by a company called True Diagnostic, and it's a biological age test. So it takes all of these researchers, everything that's come before it, and we're able to get a preview of the rate of aging, uh, an idea of how vital it is that we expose ourselves to or not to certain things. Um, and it's actually the first and most accurate test to help us slow aging. For anybody just new to genetics or epigenetics, here's just a quick biology lesson. So you're born with your genotype. This is just all the information that's found within your cell, and it's what you've inherited from your parents. So one blonde hair um, you know, cell, one brown hair cell from a parent, but your phenotype is about how that is going to be expressed. And we're talking about what's visible, what's observable. So this is what's influenced by the environment. Variables in the environment are going to basically determine how our genes are expressed. Twins. So twins are definitely the most epigenetically, genetically studied beings to date. And I always say that there's more than meets the eye. My brother and sister are twins. So I've had a lot of experience with uh, different personalities of people who came at the same time from the same parents. Uh, something we'll get into in a few minutes is the process of methylation. We talked about how that was discovered in 1975. Most of the epigenetic data and research that we use in clinical practice relies on methylation status. And we started noticing over time that differential exposures to environmental factors would either create pro-adaptation or negative adaptation over time. And the methylation pattern would diverge. So twin studies really support that our biological and our chronological age are um, interrelated towards longevity. It's important to note that of all these environmental exposures that I'm mentioning about you know, the quality of our water, pollution, et cetera, et cetera, food, that psychological stress is just as important of a variable. The quality of our relationships, the quality of all of the people that uh, we were exposed to in the womb, right when we're born, uh, and so on and so forth. So these are the major players in your, um, your life, your kids' games. You think um, your priests, your uh, parents, your grandparents, your teachers, your counselors, you know, people, people like that. These are the people who are largely shaping from a psychological perspective how methylation patterns are going to play out. So we see a lot of this in a very hotly debated topic, um, the epigenetic phenomena of multi-generational trauma. So we always say, well, it didn't start with you. Something took place before you. And we also say it's hotly debated because if I sent you all out on a research project and I divided you in half, 50% of you would come back and say, oh, the epigenetics of trauma, it's been debunked. And the other 50% of you would come with a pile of research, probably from these people I'm mentioning here, to show that we can now observe areas in the methylation pathway that objectively show how trauma is playing out, the impact of trauma on our genes. So it doesn't need to be some profound trauma. You're in a war zone. You were abused as a child, um, you were, you know, you were in an accident. It can be small incremental things over time. Uh, if a child or a person is living in an overly stressful environment, they're going to have to adapt to that in some way, either negative or positively. So uh, the stem cell biologists and epigenetic researchers that have done quite a bit in this area, have got Bruce Lipton, Rachel Yehuda, and Mark Woolen. Uh, Mark Woolen wrote a really famous book called It Didn't Start With You, and he basically puts all in one place this research. So I've, I've been in clinical practice for 20 years with epigenetics, and I'm on the side of working in multi-generational trauma. So what we 
can observe through the data now primarily are psychosocial issues, mostly depression and anxiety that shows up at the epigenetic level. Uh, we notice that autoimmune issues and cancers can become activated when a person is exposed to trauma, either a large singular event or across time. Um, and we're noticing the preponderance of more neurocognitive issues uh, with the tangled diseases, Alzheimer's, dementia, and then cardiometabolic. These are just the major things that we're seeing overall from an epigenetic perspective where trauma has influenced. So here's an interesting consideration. Uh, like I said, it's hotly debated about how trauma can influence us. Part of that is because humans are stubborn and we take a long time <laughs> to change our minds. So I thought I would show this for a minute. Some of you may have seen this. You can see these three slides here. So all of our identity and our expectations, they're based on all of our past experiences. And this is built from society, from culture, and we are expending cognitive energy. We have to make a decision. Do we want to perpetuate something or do we want to do something about it? And it literally takes energy, cellular energy. And so often out of survival, uh, sometimes fear or duty beliefs that we have, we decide that we're going to just um, continue on. And so we observe this in the epigenome. We observe this in methylation patterns. So past learning can literally blind us to relative truth. So you can you can see off to the side. I have this you know little blurb here. When you first look at it, what you know what do you see? You see Einstein's face. If you really study the three, you'll notice that most of us are ignoring those little shadow lines that are along the side of his face. We're going, oh, that's the front of his face. But if you watch how the mask is turning, you go, oh, actually that's the back of the mask. But it's just easier for us to accept it's the front of his face. And so this is one reason why it takes us such a long time to make these epigenetic changes. But we don't have to take that long. I just wanted to put it out there to show people, you actually have health in your hands and the highest quality question you can ask yourself is why you are perpetuating something and what you're getting out of it. So let's talk a little bit about what I mentioned earlier, this biological age versus chronological age. Chronological is from when you're born until when you pass. Uh, and biological age is really, really dynamic. This is your age based on all the variables from the environment, how they're influencing, how your physiology is changing, expanding, and growing. So we look at organ function, cellular aging, uh, different biological markers. So it's literally influenced by everything. Biological age is your uh, age across time. So let's keep going here so we can get into the nuance of this. Earlier, I mentioned a gentleman, his name was Horvath. So he developed the first epigenetic clock. He took what he thought was the most vital information based on the trajectory, trajectory of his research. What was showing was moving the needle on methylation. Uh, and he looked specifically at multiple types of tissues. Then clocks two and three, the Hanum and the Pheno age clock, those were looking um, at the phenotyping that we talked about earlier. And the Hanum clock was good, but it didn't really include enough variables. So Horvath improved upon his clock and he uh, affectionately <laughs> named it the Grim age clock, uh, you know, the Grim Reaper. And he started to add more biomarkers to it because what he was starting to notice is that that you have not only all these variables that influence you across time, but that some of us are aging faster. So someone else beat them to the actual uh, rate of aging clock. So we've got a rate of aging clock. This is measuring how fast you're aging. It's how fast the clock is ticking. So it tends to be more accurate from an objective perspective. And it's really the best to gauge new intervention. So here's a good way to think about this um, if you want to use it in your own health um, path. If 
you are doing any test like this as your baseline and you want to know if all of the therapies you've been doing up until now are helping, you would be able to look at what moves the needle the fastest. This is able to show you um, whether it's something like blood ozone or your meditation or taking supplements or going for a walk, what's slowing or accelerating the clock. So it's a great way to invest into ourselves so we can know, are we spending this money in vain on all of these therapies or could we perhaps put our therapies in a different order? So when people are asking, do I wanna really pay for epigenetic testing? That's a great way to actually play the long game and save money and be able to closely gauge if your therapies are working. So the best clock today is called the Dundin Pace Clock. And Dundin is a little tiny city in New Zealand. And they've been looking at people across the past two decades, all of our, all of our hallmarks of aging. So we have our aging uh, biomarkers such as grip strength, brain shrinkage, our dental health. Um, if you follow biological medicine, you know that dental health is uh, basically part of whole health. And then we look at blood markers across the whole entire um, world, cholesterol and inflammation. And one of the really cool things is what, what grew out of this is it inspired scientists all over the world to start to look at, oh, what variables in our environment are shaping uh, the rate of aging. So we still wanna look at the biological clock because we have to look at everything that we've thrown at the body over time to have an idea of what's speeding it up, what's slowing it down. So we look at biological clocks more of what we've accumulated across our lifespan. And we look at rate of aging clocks as a way to optimize our health span. So here's a little telomere at the very tip of a chromosome, you've got your telomeres. So telomeres are the repetitive DNA sequence that's located at the ends. It's really, really important for aging in general, but really specifically the rate of aging. So telomeres help prevent the loss of genetic material necessary for us to carry out all of our biological functions across time. It's also crucial that we optimize telomere length when we're talking about preventing disease, especially things that become activated over time, like cancers, autoimmune issues and these cardiometabolic uh, issues. We've done the most research with telomeres and uh, telomere therapy activation by looking at how they help to prevent cancers, how they especially help to prevent uh, more neurological issues. So one of the little snapshots I have over here, I put therapies to optimize telomere length. We'll come back to that later, but concentrated red light, NMN, resveratrol, epitalin peptide. These are all of the new medicine types of therapies. We can still use the tried and true exercise, meditation, supplementation, but one of the reasons that we've gotten ourselves to needing these things is because what we've observed epigenetically over time is that telomeres are shortening at a very fast rate. So we need to be able to give our bodies therapies that are commensurate to being able to get those telomeres long and strong, essentially, to keep us alive as long as we plan to be alive. Okay, so we've arrived at methylation. You've heard me mention this a few times. So epigenetics is really based on how we're methylating, DNA methylation. And to break it down and to simplify it, Methylation just drives the bus of everything. It influences basically the production of and the behavior of DNA and RNA. It helps us to produce hormones, activate them, uh, and to also help us keep them from misbehaving. Helps us promote the production of neurotransmitters and then of um, amino acids and antioxidants, also red blood cells. So this is the process of methylation is really what helps us um, determine whether or not these gene groups will be expressed positively or negatively. And in the process of methylation, we can have too much of it or we can not have enough. 
And we can have both of those things going on simultaneously. So we wanna make sure that we're giving the body the information it needs to optimize that delicate balance. So we can methylate too quickly. Sometimes we can methylate too slowly, which means we're accelerating disease process. Or if we're, op we're optimizing our methylation, we're preventing disease. Because when we optimize methylation, we actually optimize our telomere length. So we are taking these new biological clocks and observing the methylation pathway. And we're getting this big preview of how fast we're doing it. So we can slow that clock or speed it up if we need to. So I think everybody can relate to a couple of the things on here. These are the hallmark signs of needing some support with methylation. Everybody can say, okay, well, I've experienced these, you know, on and off, but some people will look at one, two, or all five of these and go, oh, this is happening to me every single day of my life. But it's not doom or gloom. It's an opportunity. You now know that you can methylate better. You now know that you can look at your epigenome and you have control over it. So it's a great time to take inventory and ask yourself, where am I today? How could I have potentially gotten here? You are going to take an inventory of the quality of your relationships, the quality of your food, quality of everything you're feeding your body with. So let's talk a little bit about epigenetic tests and how we can optimize methylation. So we've got whole genome testing. That is the self-decode that I was talking about earlier. That accounts for over 1 million trait expressions. So remember how I was saying that genes load the gun, epigenetics pull the trigger. So when we look at whole genome testing and methylation testing together, the methylation testing can show us why those genes have expressed based on the different exposures. So we're not sitting there wondering why a disease state has been activated. Uh, and then biological age testing really takes all of it, puts it together and can say with high significant accuracy, you need to slow down aging in this area. If we optimize your immune system based on your genetic traits that we're seeing, we can prevent cancer, we can prevent autoimmunity, we can help you get happier, and so on and so forth. So these tests are typically done biannually. Now we have tests that we use to gauge the success of the, op the epigenetic modifications that we're using. I recommend these specific tests as baselines. And people always ask me, well, why wouldn't I want to just start with a simple blood test. You always want to start with a test that is going to be commensurate to whatever your goals are for health. If you just want to treat a symptom, a blood test might be the best thing for you because you can look at how things are changing for every couple of days. However, if you back up and you look at epigenetic tests, now you're going to be able to see the influence of what you've exposed yourself to. And I broke these up into three really important categories. They're all interrelated. If you're looking at the slide right now, you can get a good sense of how they're interrelated, but this is what has been influencing us the most over the past 10 to 20 years. We're seeing the preponderance of the tangled diseases, cardiometabolic issues, uh, and psychosocial issues on the rise. So we look at these cool tests called neural zoomers. And they look at how things are, how toxins are crossing the blood brain barrier, which cause neural inflammation and can basically contribute to what I was just talking about, cognitive issues. So when we then move on and we look at a brain gut test, now we're looking at all of the microbiology that we may have um, picked up, things that have kind of hitched a ride with us. And we look at those so that we can make sure on an epigenetic level that we can create what I call an inhospitable environment for these particular things. When we look at our baseline data of our epigenetics and we can say, here, I'll give you an example. When we look at something called the BDNF gene and how it's expressing, 
brain derived neurotropic factor. This influences uh, how we think and feel, our ability to exercise, uh, definitely influencing our brain gut health. When we can look at how that's expressing, and then we go and we do a test like this, the brain gut test, we can clearly see objective data to show us, oh, well, this is the reason that these traits are expressing. And this is why I have brain fog after I eat. This is why I can't get out of bed in the morning. Oh, you know, if you're sharing your body with <laughs> unwanted uh, guests, so to speak, you know, they're, they're competing for that telomere length. You want to use all your good therapy to optimize aging, and they want to use all of that therapy, all those nutrients for themselves. So because they can cross the blood brain barrier and they will tell your body that you're experiencing an emergency, we definitely want to take inventory of them because we don't want to increase the influence of how the epigenome is being influenced at the cardiovascular neural level. And then we look at all the other fun stuff, pesticides, plastics, phthalates. Um, for those of you new to PCFAs, those are forever chemicals that have been identified in the environment. And then parabens, heavy metals, and VOCs. These are so important. They typically come from the good old industrial revolution and um, you know, corporatization of the environment. And because our skin is our biggest organ, and when we inhale and have really permeable lungs, what happens? We now have such a huge gateway for all of these things to be coming at us all of the time. So we need to identify where, where we're at. Do we have an accumulation of these? Do we need to do something about it? Do we also have an accumulation of parasites, viruses, mycotoxins? And here's kind of a staggering statistic. Uh, parasites can hold on to eight times their weight which sounds kind of gross. So what do parasites store inside of them? Pesticides, plastics, parabens, all of these things. So it's worth its weight, literally in gold, for you to do these tests to optimize your epigenetics and to prevent your body from going down the path of you know, developing a disease state. So let's get into some of the therapies that I love. And you're gonna notice there are some really advanced, ahead of trend things mentioned here, and then there's our tried and true. So if we have a goal for health of, I wanna reverse disease, or we have a goal for health of, I wanna to live to 120, I don't have a disease state. All of these things are very dynamic and can be used at any particular time, but these are the particular therapies across the past 25 years that have been shown in objective and subjective research to elicit uh, the best results to improve the epigenetic uh, expression. So meditation, stress reduction, Tai Chi, those are a great way to take health into your own hands. Everybody's familiar with how to do those things. We can literally see on the methylation pathway, something called COMT, it stands for co-methyltransferase, and that is basically in charge of how our fight or flight hormones are recycled or not. So if we have been under stress for a long time, it's literally like going to one of those splash parks where the bucket is kind of just waiting to tip on you. And if the gene isn't expressing optimally, that bucket just tips on you and you suddenly feel like you're in a fight or flight when you would otherwise be enjoying yourself or calm. So what we've put to the test is when we use meditation, stress reduction techniques, Tai Chi, against the expression of that COMT. And what we notice is that those catecholamines, those fight or flight hormones, they quiet down, they simmer down, and we can get ourselves into that rest and digest, uh, relaxed state. And then we have um, some things that other people will be familiar with. We have neurofeedback, um, smartceuticals. So smartceuticals are nutraceuticals, high level supplements, um, NMN, resveratrol, resveratrol, quercetin, facetin. Those are the things that have been shown to optimize the entire methylation pathway. So if you were somebody who is a healthy person getting healthier, or you want to jump into 
disease reversal. These are what have been shown to elicit the biggest effect across the whole entire methylation pathway, across the whole entire epigenome. They help us to produce more hor hormones. They help us to prevent um, cognitive issues. They reduce inflammation, uh, help us with short and long-term memory, and they've been shown to help us get into a more parasympathetic state. Um, there's the obvious one, organic biodynamic longevity whole foods, like Liz was saying earlier, eating as closely to where we live uh, and as clean as possible makes the most sense. When we eat close to home, we know what's going into our food supply and we can do something about it. That was why I showed that slide in the very beginning of my grandmother and my daughter in Sicily. You walk out of your house, arm in arm with your friend, and you go and you know your farmer. And chances are they just picked those fresh crops or they came up from the sea and you're getting them fresh in that day. So that's feeding yourself high quality information. And that's why we look at our environment and ask ourselves, what's the quality of the information that we're exposing ourselves to? So let's celebrate for a minute. I kind of went over some of these, but I wanted to just highlight these. So the results of epigenetics upgraded. Here's what I've seen. Here's what I continue to see. Here's what my um, you know, private practice people report. So we definitely see overall uh, more optimized quality of life. And what's quality of life? We use the term health span. Uh, you know, if you've got five minutes to live or 50 years to live, let's hope that it's the best five minutes or 50 years. So we also see improved um, grip strength and balance. And that's huge for anybody who's looking at the research in prevention of anything that's neurocognitive. We know that grip strength is a big hallmark. And then the other things that I uh, had already mentioned, but a few more, we see a significant reduction for uh, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, cardiovascular concerns, thyroid issues, and then just overall ability to stay in that more preventive state overall. So you can be dealt those cards and you can look back at your entire family line and instead of saying, you know, grandpa, dad, they had cardiovascular issues, well, I'm gonna too. Now, you know, you can stop it in its tracks and you can do something about it. Uh, memory and focus are being optimized and we know how challenged our concentration is these days. We see the evidence of that in the um, epigenetic testing. Fitness levels have been optimized. And one of my favorites is uh, you're saving more money. And you get to continue to do what matters most to you. And I think that's probably what's the most important thing about epigenetics and why I say it's cause for celebration because we, we do live in a toxic world, but we also can take health into our own hands. We have the most sophisticated testing and we're able to utilize it every step of the way to shift that trajectory. So it'd be interesting um, you know, to hear from people in your environment and ask them how they've you know, been able to continue playing tennis and pickleball at 95 years old, how you know, they're playing with their grandchildren and they can do things with them. And I don't know about you, but um, you know, I wanna be on a beach in Sicily when I'm 95 <laughs> years old. So that's why I say it's cause for celebration. So I also included a few links for everybody to kind of look at on their own. It's research of interest. This kind of goes through the whole trajectory of objective, um, more scientific with methylation and the genome. And then it also is gonna touch on some of that transgenerational stuff. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. That was awesome. I'm just reading your, your final quote. Yeah, Thich Nhat Hanh, he's a favorite of mine. My mom introduced me to him a long time ago and it really, it really resonates. If anything, we need something to inspire us to take health into our own hands. It's a big job and it's nice when you recruit yourself and then you can recruit everybody else in your family. 
Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much. I really actually, now I kind of get, under, I understand methylation now, <laughs> whereas before it was a little bit of a foreign concept. It's like, wow, I get it. It's um, good, I love it. All right, so I'm gonna hop over to the chat. Um, Great. But in the meantime, I'd love to know, what does the NMN stand for? You mentioned it a few times as a therapy. What is that exactly? Yeah, so you have NMAD, N, I'm sorry, NMN and NAD, okay? And NMN is a precursor to NAD. This is, okay. an, yeah, so these are anti-aging molecules that we already have in our body to just break it down for you. Um, and they're responsible for, when I was going like this, the tips of your telomeres, you have to have uh, enough NMN to convert to NAD. So we hear about people getting um, these NAD longevity drips. And the question is, well, is my, is my body even able to use it? So we fuel the body with the NMN to convert it into NAD, which then we're able to synthesize better proteins, make better neurotransmitters, prevent disease. So it's a hot topic right now for sure. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question. What about, can any, can someone optimize their epigenetic expression in order to increase their um, cognitive IQ? Absolutely. We see this all the time. In fact, True Diagnostic is running a contest and it's basically biohackers and anybody who wants to jump in, who's doing all of these higher level therapies to see, all right, what's moving the needle most. And we definitely find that as fight or flight hormones go down and your parasympathetic nervous system is optimized, that IQ is optimized as well. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And what else? Let's see, I had a poll. I have my own questions here that I was coming out with them as you were going along. Um, I'm also, I understand also that this is, this can be true for alcoholism. I mean, for many people, they look back in their, their history and their family history of oh, the alcoholism or the mental illness. So those things you're saying, we can essentially put the kibosh on if we are proactive in this way. Is that what we're hearing? Absolutely. So it's about making a decision, A, that you want to even accept that your environment influences you. Um, and when you accept that and you go, oh, wait a minute, my environment influences me so I can change my environment and I can change my life. Oh, cool. So we start there, right? With that realization. But what I've observed over time is what I was mentioning earlier insofar as I mentioned the grandfather, the dad having cardiovascular issues, and then the son or grandchild not developing those. So when you look at all of your epigenetics, your methylation pathway, you're, you're going to see all sorts of things that might look scary, right? But you can look to not only specific traits around alcoholism or mental health, but also about metabolism, also um, related to habit seeking. So there's general and specific gene families, and we observe how they're playing together, so to speak. And then we look at what information from the environment that we've been exposed to, to say, okay, we have habit seeking over here. And I've been exposed to a lot of habit seekers, dopamine seekers. Well, it turns out that I've got negative trait expression going on in my dopamine pathway. So you start to look at the nuance of how all of these little traits play with one another. And then you look at the methylation pathway to see, all right, what can I optimize over here to get those traits to express in my favor. So insofar as, um, you know, alcoholism, it's related to those COMTs and those um, corticotropins that I talked about earlier. It's just getting the granular data and me telling you right now, there's an abundance of therapies that can get matched right up to those specific trait expressions. So it isn't just one therapy to prevent expression across, you know, five different gene families. You can use something like uh, naltrexone for one person. You can use uh, talk therapy or 
neurofeedback for another person if they're going to be more driven in a neurological direction. For some people, it's literally about some people don't have any habit seeking genetic expression, but what they do have is a lot of cardio metabolic and they have a lot of issues with cortisol and insulin. And when those pathways are off, we seek our stress level goes up and we basically do what we seek to bring the body back to balance. And so it isn't even out of having a negative habit. It's sometimes we're literally drinking to put something into the body to calm it down from that perspective. So I always say it's a tough one, but don't judge a book by their cover because you always need to learn someone's story according to the, how it's being reflected in their epigenetics before you go and treat something. Does that help answer your question the way you yes. asked it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, speaking of these tests, so I have a two-part question. One, where does someone go to get the tests, the ones that you mentioned and highlighted specifically? And is it possible for someone to read the results themselves or should they work one-on-one -on -one with a practitioner? What, do, what happens after the tests come back? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So I believe in everybody holding their own health in their own hands. So of course you can go out on your own, you can purchase these. And if you're you know, a high level citizen scientist, health enthusiast, maybe you're gonna be able to go ahead and do it on your own. It depends what framework that you're looking at. I can say for uh, you know, my personal recommendation, my professional recommendation is I always see people get the best results when they look at epigenetics through the lens of biological medicine. Biological medicine is all about preparing the body to receive treatment. And it's all about knowing where to start with the nervous system and getting the body out of a stressed state. So instead of putting the cart before the horse and going and using those epigenetic tests and just trying to treat the symptoms, when we start with a biological medical lens, uh, working with a practitioner, typically we have more optimized outcomes. So you can either go through practitioners like me, um, all of my biomed network of people at the biomed center, biologics, innovative medicine. They're really the ones who are doing this more top level integrative, you know, biological epigenetic medicine. So self decode is the particular test that I look at. If you want to look at the expanse of the entire genome. And then I use true age as my rate of aging biological age test. And the two play really nice together. Um, both of the people that developed it, they work you know, together. And what, you know, basically what we do is you get kits, one is a blood, one is saliva, and the results come back and we sit and we start to have this conversation about, all right, what have you been exposed to? And we of course talk about you know, all your relationships, your family, et cetera. And then we can look at that data and apply it to you. That's why we call it the art and science of practicing epigenetic medicine. So yeah, I definitely do recommend that people work with a practitioner so that they can get this higher level. And honestly, most people are going to save more money if they're working with a practitioner as opposed to, you know, just treating symptoms. But yes, of course, you can go online, you can buy these tests um, because you do own your own health for sure. Okay, great. I think that may have answered uh, Kathleen's questions about, she had a question about what um, the self-decode tests and the true diagnostic tests were using so serum or saliva and you said blood uh, is one and serum is another. Yeah, and you're gonna see um, what's great about both of these companies in particular is their very, very well funded. They're very ethical and they're completely committed to creating something for people. And they're completely committed to developing um, the very best testing methods. So yes, right now, self-decode is available through saliva, true diagnostic, like I said, that's through blood, but you'll see some of those things changing to make it even more convenient to consumers. Okay, fascinating. Um, I had a question for a participant today asking about um, kind of feeling really terrible since the Moderna vaccine from COVID two years ago with lots of inflammation uh, and low energy and insomnia, kind of those things in the slide. Are all of those therapies, she asks, able to reverse uh, any of these symptoms? 
Yeah, absolutely. So what I love about, well, they can't come out and tell you this. I can tell you this. Uh, on self-decode, there are incredible traits that basically you can think of it like a castle. You've got your king and queen being protected up in the tower, and then you have your infantry soldiers and so on and so forth, right? Out in front of the gate. Think of our immune system like that. There are certain genes that reflect the infantry soldiers and so on up to the king and the queen, right? And so when you look at your methylation, you can go, oh, all right, my infantry soldiers, they need to be optimized to protect my, what's called immunosenescence, like my rate of immune system aging. So you can use self-decode to get a preview of how those genes are expressing. And it'll tell you why you've responded to the um, mRNA in the way that you have. It can also give you a snapshot of other things that your body could sort of be competing with. Like let's, you know, let's say you have some metabolic trait expression and your rate of detoxification is really slow. That could be another reason why you're experiencing, you know, the fatigue, just feeling general malaise, et cetera. So all of those therapies that I mentioned, once you have your testing, you can dial those in. So you know which ones to start with and continue on with overall. I will just quickly say that what we're learning about peptide therapy is it can kind of take you to the head of the class oftentimes. So if you work with a really experienced provider who understands um, like, or who can go over all of this testing with you, they can optimize things a lot quicker, a lot faster with peptides for sure, because they send a top, less, top level message to the brain. And then you get this amazing trickle down effect in almost real time. Hmm. Um, thank you. That's kind of interesting because one of my questions that I had for you is what is on the horizon and what is exciting for you? What excites you about the future of this sort of territory? <laughs> Yeah, I think what excites me is that, and it might sound simple, but people are excited to know that they can take health into their own hands because the data is inexpensive. They can purchase it and they can see that they're investing into their short and long-term health in such an empowered way. The I'm excited that the tests just keep getting better and they're telling us so much more about how gene families play together. And I don't know about you, but I like to spend my money on vacations and going and doing really fun things. And so I'm excited that I can go do that more. <laughs> and I don't need to be thinking about my health. I can go be living. You know, my lifestyle can be health. And this is something that I've been talking about a lot with the people from True Diagnostic and Self Decode. The information is just becoming so much more nuanced, but simplified to say, all right, it's not going to take you five years to reverse this disease. Go do these five therapies and do them over this trajectory and you're going to be golden. The fact that we can reverse aging, we can reverse blindness, we can reverse MS, reverse dementia. I mean, that's, that's huge. If you think about how many people are affected by dementia and Alzheimer's now compared to other parts of the world and to know that we're reversing it. I, I think that age reversal is probably the most important thing. And when I say age reversal, I don't want to be a teenager again. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about going back in time, but I'm talking about just uh, this quality of life. I can slow down the rate that my body is aging overall. So the therapies are becoming more commensurate to the research. It used to be that the research was so advanced that we didn't yet have the therapies. And now things are coming more closely together uh, so that we can do short bursts of therapies and then be able to meditate. Meditation can just be the therapy, right? We're just living our lives, meditating and walking and grounding and eating really beautiful food and swimming in the ocean and getting those negative ions. I'm most excited to return to simplicity the way that my Sicilian family did it, I think. Oh, great, awesome. What about, like, how long does it 
take? I know we're all individual people, but how long would it take to start seeing some of these changes taking place within us? Or is there a way to then you test again? Like you said, I think you have a frequency of testing, but is there a typical period where you notice the change and the effects happening? Yeah, there's a, so when we look at the methylation pathway, we can go, oh, I'm dumping the wrong form of a B vitamin in oh, I'm eating too many foods with sulfurs right now at this stage. So we can quickly change a few things around, take out sulfur, um, replace a methylated form of a B vitamin with a hydroxy form of it. We, we basically can prepare the body to receive healing by quickly looking at what's on that methylation pathway and adjusting a few things. When you take, if you're somebody who's having a difficult time processing sulfur and you take it away from the body temporarily, you could feel like a million dollars. So what, what would you see? Uh, people come to me with histamine responses and so-called allergies. Usually those are sensitivities to something because you're either over or under methylating. So when we get the right form of a nutrient or we adjust something dietarily, we can see results literally within days. And people are blown away when they do because they will literally say, oh my gosh, I've been living my life for 20 years. I had no idea. And that's such a great sign when you can change things in just a few days. But um, you know, overall, we need to take a good hard look at our detox pathways. When we get our methylation results back, it's showing us, are we detoxing? Are we not? And once we make that determination, that will help us determine how quickly we can accelerate healing. So people who experience fatigue, brain fog, there are just some really simple things you can do with diet and nutrition. For other people, you can look at um, and notice that there's a lot of inflammation in the um, pathway. And you can do something like blood ozone or oxygen therapies. And within two months, the person will be moving their hands or um, you know, be able to raise up, have, have more grip strength. And that's huge for someone who hasn't been able to do that in such a long period of time. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, any final thoughts there? Are, we have a couple more minutes. Um, I have a question, one is here for, uh, do you have a preference of those two tests? Which Both. would you recommend? Okay, so straight up. <laughs> yeah, so you, choose, I'll, you choose. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what a lot of people are doing. Um, humans are impatient, but they take a long time to do things, which is so funny, right? Like we talked about earlier. So the true diagnostic, if you had to just pick one test, the true diagnostic test, is, and you're going to do it yourself, the true diagnostic test is probably a good place to start. Because while self decode does come with lists and lists and lists of recommendations, um, you know, you'd have to go take out a $5 million loan to buy all of those recommendations from self decode. But I do both of those together because now I can see how gene families are playing nice together or not. And when I'm only doing true diagnostic, I'm really looking at the rate of aging. I'm not able to most precisely know exactly what has accelerated metabolism or what has accelerated, um, you know, brain neurotropic factor. Hopefully when you asked a few minutes ago, what's on the horizon, um, what I'm seeing and hearing is that we're going to get a combination test one of these mm -hmm. here days in the next couple of years, which makes the most sense. They've both sort of attempted it and they need each other at this point is what we're seeing. What's it called? There's the self-decode and then there's the true diagnostic. And we're seeing that both of those are most likely going to be coming together over the next few oh. years. Oh. There's links for both of the tests in the chat log. If anybody's looking at the chat log. Thank you. We are just at our 10 o'clock frame. So I do want to say thank you so much to Christine, of course, for being here today. That was an amazing presentation. And just as a reminder, you'll be getting uh, resources, the list of links, plus slides, plus the recording um, within a week or so. Um, and um, any final thoughts from Liz or Christine? 
Just a big thank you to everybody being here. Um, all I ask is go share it with your family, shout it from the rooftops and write to me and let me know how you do with all of it. I'm excited for everybody to take it into their own hands. Awesome. Thank I'm you. gonna stop the, go ahead and stop the recording, but um, I'll keep the Zoom room open. I, I will just say that um, some of those tests can be, you can see Christine and work with Christine on those tests. You can reach out to the Biomed Center in Providence, Rhode Island and work with the team there on those tests. Um, so there, there are places that you can go. And if you're looking for that contact information, reach out to Jessica and she can provide that to you. Thanks, Christine. That was so good. Really Thank enjoyed you. it. That was really fun. I loved being here. Everybody wants to go get the test right now. I do. Good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. We'll Thank see you, you next month. Have a great one.